Good evening, welcome to Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Ibrahim Sani. This is the show that wants you to consider and reconsider the news of the day. So Ibrahim, what struck you the most in terms of the news cycle today? Uh, there's plenty. Um, most importantly, the Jakarta capital movement that's happening and we're going to talk about it very shortly. Mm -hmm. But G7 is big uh, that we need to talk about. Yep. Um, and of course, one of the biggest things is that uh, prior to doing this show, I didn't realize that China wasn't part of G7. No, of course. G7 is made out of uh, Britain, Canada, the US, Italy, Germany, Japan, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. I'm yeah. missing someone else. Canada, I'm yeah. missing Canada. So yes, of course, the 45th G Summit um, was happening over the weekend. It's, I think, the last day is on Monday, isn't it? It's still happening, It's actually. still happening. Uh, one interesting uh, point to note is that Iran dropped by, made a surprise visit. <laughs> Just dropped um, by. Yeah, and it was warmly welcomed. Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor, did say that those are the kind of things that they need to see and these negotiations do happen. But the main point is that, is G7 still relevant? Yeah. And in fact, uh, as I mentioned earlier, China is not representing uh, this, uh, in, uh, or not represented in this meeting. Uh, one thing that we need to also mention is that the entire cabinet, sorry, the entire uh, continent of Africa is not going to be represented. Uh, India is not represented. Brazil is not uh, represented. So who is... G7, yeah. who are they representing? You know, uh, um, exactly. I think there have been concerns raised, especially of late, that perhaps the bloc has, uh, you know, whether it still has a place on the world stage. Now, for me, I would say, you know, it's really quite interesting because if you look at G7, uh, yeah, Ibrahim, and you look at all the countries that are part of this, you know, supposed to be the group of seven most powerful nations of the world, almost every single leader is embattled in his or her own country, dealing with some kind of domestic politics. Donald Trump, uh, Macron, we have Trudeau, Angela Merkel is no longer going to be the chancellor next year, Shinzo Abe. Every single world leader is essentially dealing with his or her own problems. Not to mention Boris Johnson and his Brexit. <laughs> I'm not even going to go there, right? Yeah. So also, I mean, in the same you know vein, uh, we know that uh, the European Commission is represented, uh, and of course Donald Tusk is there, mm -hmm. and uh, Donald Tusk is speaking with uh, Boris Johnson about Brexit, and we all know the hard Brexit is going to happen on 31st of October. We have no plans whatsoever, concrete moving forward and we now know that the conversation is on how will EU uh, going to deal with uh, Brexit there's still nothing concrete following it so you got G7 mm. not representing the global economy fast-growing economies like Africa fast-growing economies like uh, India and China is not represented and they're not reaching any concrete measures in terms of whoever that was attending they can't agree concretely on the kind of steps to move forward. You know why? Because this year's G7 summit, which most G7 summits usually end with a, I guess, a final statement. It's signed by all the members, but this year they've decided that they're not going to do this. Why? Because they want to avoid disagreements over wordings within the final statement. So clearly, they can't they can't, you know, uh, no. I guess, yeah. uh, make nice the, the, and even come wording, up with a final the, statement. The, the thing that we need to look at is the communique mm, uh, that uh, is right. signed by all these seven people, uh, seven countries, and there's no way you can agree to these kind of things. So here's the thing, Ibrahim. If G7 is perhaps on the decline, could we now be seeing the rise of the G20? Yes. As the main summit yes. of, you know, what of a global power. And and we, we know for a fact that Indonesia is part of the G20, uh, and therefore they can argue not just on Indonesia's behalf, but on ASEAN's behalf right. as well. China is well represented in the G20, and you could see the G20 being represented by fast-growing economies, the same economies that we know mm. that is going to be the big economies in just 10 or 20 years from now. So well, yes. Or the G20 countries make up 80% of the, G the world's GDP, also two-thirds of the world's population. So there you go. Perhaps you're going to be seeing the rise of G20 next. Uh, but for other news of the day, I have to say one thing that struck me today, Ibrahim, was really the cabinet approving the implementation of the National Digital Identity Initiative. So the, digital, the National Digital ID is an initiative under the Communications and Multimedia Ministry, MCMC, and it's meant to be a method of authenticating a user's identity online. 
Now, the question is, what do you think about it? I think it's good because you know for a fact that the national digital ID is not a substitute for the existing ICs that we have or the identity card. It is not compulsory. Um, and what we do know is that an, an, a Malaysian is issued an IC number on uh, birth. Mm. Uh, and the My Card currently stores information on the contact chip, on the physical contact right. chip. But uh, while uh, all this is stored in the IC, the national digital identity is just to allow the migration of uh, brick and mortar presence into online presence. It's not a substitute, but it's a necessity. Well, you know, the digital IC, that smart chip in your IC, that came out, what, 15 years ago? And mm -hmm. technology has advanced advanced so much since then. So the idea is, I guess, to kind of keep us up to date with the times. Now, when we talk about digitalization and digitizing, this is really a key component of that. So the government, the MCMC, has actually come out to say that the digi national digital ID is meant to spur confidence of uh, Malaysians' confidence in the digital economy. Now, the question is, is it going to be enough to change people's perceptions? So, you know, if it's going to spur confidence, are we admitting right now that there's a lack of confidence? Yeah, it is. There's a lack of confidence. Not because so much of the fact that uh, this is uh, uh, a good thing for Malaysians or a bad thing for Malaysians. Malaysians generally are open to the idea of new things. Malaysians are generally open to trying out new um, uh, yeah, payment we're quite, methods. We're quite game for that, we right? Are. Yeah. But Malaysians are extremely sceptical for things that are being rolled out by this uh, country and by this government and the previous government yeah, as the well. The distrust, the trust deficit. Because we know rolling out is a big problem. Rolling out stuff is, uh, you're going to get glitches, you're going to get, you know, we know that uh, if it's being rolled out by, by a particular agency, for instance, the immigration, then things could be better. You can get half an hour passport, yeah. but it's not that easy to do to roll out so many other things as well. Exactly. Sometimes it's in the implementation where this country falls short. Now, we have also to remember that you know legal frameworks will have to change too, uh, and consumer behaviours and mindsets will have to change. But I'm, I'm with you, Ibrahim. I'm quite optimistic. I think if you take a look at just the way we've adopted you know, tolls, for instance, from using a kind of cash-based system to using the touch-and-go and then the smart tag, and now eventually we're going to be adopting RFID as well. So I think consumer behaviours can change. It just might take us a little bit longer. All right, we're going to come back on Consider This and take a closer look at Malaysia's Child Sexual Offenders Registry. Stay tuned to Consider This.